And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a set of newcomers to the temple. Creators of the upcoming adventure, The Devil's Bridge, bringing Slavic mythology to the world's most popular role-playing game. Sorry, I had to do that joke. <laughs> um, the one the one and only Yellow Madhouse. How are you guys doing today, man? Good, good. Thank you very much for accepting us into your temple. We are humbled and honored to be to be here tonight. Mm -hmm. So, part of my tradition is um, the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Right, well, it all started around when we were all around 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Originally, we were introduced to role-playing games through LARPing, live-action role-play. Oh, okay. And uh, we all started playing together, and about half a year into LARPing, we got introduced to D&D. &D. Because we basically found out that we can do the same thing, but at home on the table. And that was groundbreaking. And it blew our minds, literally. And since then, we've been hooked. So would, would it be fair of me to say that you, that you all have, um, have, stuck to get, have stuck together when it comes to role playing for a, for a um, good long while? Oh, a very long while. I mean, most of us are, all of us are between 25 and 30 at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's been, what, more than more than 15 years of some. So it's it's been a while, and it's not going to change anytime soon. And when it comes... Now, with that in mind, when it comes to... When it comes to the idea for the Devil's Bridge, um, was was this a um, was this based on your based on adventures that you had run yourself beforehand that you that you just decided to adapt into into Five E or how did it um, come about? So originally, the idea why we came together as a group was to create something a lot bigger than an adventure. We started with the campaign a campaign setting in mind. Mm -hmm. And we quickly realized that it is a bit too much of a colossal task to start uh, to start with. However, we've we've done a lot of work on it already. And one of the things that that the guys were researching at the time was a monster of Bulgarian folklore called the Talisum. Mm -hmm. And Around the Talisman, one of the guys in the group wrote a short story and just for the guys in the team. And he was like, oh, my God, guys, I've written this short story. Do you want to check it out? And myself and Martin got inspired by the short story and wrote a short adventure just for the guys in the group to, to basically to run for them. And what happened was after running the adventure, all of the guys started throwing ideas to how to improve it how to make it richer and more interesting. And we basically quickly realized that it would be the best way to introduce what we're trying to get to and to introduce the, the world that we want to create. Yeah. Now, what, and I did, I did note that the um, first entry on your blog um, was a discussion about the Talisum. And... What I'm curious, what I'm curious about is it. It outright mentions that the talisman could be considered obscure. Um, what was it about that particular um, demon that sparked such imagination? Um, put it this way: we're all we're all fans of of um, adventures where there isn't clear cut good and bad. Mm -hmm. We all love playing in the gray middle ground where your actions could be seen as good or bad depending on on what side of 
of the on which side you're on. Some people might think that what you're doing is not cool at all, but some people might see it as a righteous cause. And all the legends around the Talisman that we read had this kind of dualism around them. Um, it all goes back to sacrifices being made back in the day. For example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to build a building on a piece of land, you had to pay for that building to be there, but you can't pay with money to to Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So you had to sacrifice something to show to show that you really intend for this thing to be brought to life. And this kind of merging of of good and evil, of right and wrong, really, really tickled our interest. So we decided to focus on to this side of things and delve a bit further, which then unlocked a lot of ideas and brought about the Devil's Bridge. Yeah. Now... The Devil's Bridge is, um, as I mentioned, as mentioned before, is bringing in Slavic mythology into um, D and D's sandbox. So, what what sparked the interest in the, in that particular um, region? Well, we we are all from Bulgarian origin, mm -hmm. and we grew up with literature lessons basically saying the stories of Baba Yaga, saying the stories of the three-headed Zmei dragon. And when we grew up playing role-playing games, we kind of saw a... it was missing. We couldn't play through the stories that we grew up with and, and basically with the characters that we grew up with. So... We wanted to create something that both people from the Slavic countries can relate to and can see represented, and people from the other parts of the world can be introduced to and see the colorful folklore that we have. And, and when, it come, when it comes to that, now, obviously there are certain cultural mythologies that people are going to be more familiar with than 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 um others um ju just by just by um for lack of a better term osmosis in um mm. in fa in fantasy gaming as a whole but slavic is one that i um i don't i don't see as i don't see as often so what i'm curious about is what is um what would be what would be some of the motif what would be some of the motifs to emphasize if someone is running a more slavic um aligned um session of d and d hmm as i mentioned uh the the whole mixture between right and wrong uh mm -hmm. in in uh, in slavic folklore and mythology there is creatures represented in so many ways because obviously different different regions have different versions of every every story mm -hmm. some if let's take the talisman for example some some regions say that it's a spirit that protects the household which is i mean relatively good if you think about it other people say that it's a shadow demon that haunts abandoned buildings and basically, depending on the story that you read and you're exposed to, each creature has a different, a different side to it exposed. So it is very important to keep in mind that not everything is good or bad when you mm -hmm. run a Slavic adventure. Um, furthermore, I would, I would say, because we, we like to get very immersed into into playing when we do we have a setup around us we like can we like lighting candles and having little props and stuff i would say it's very it would be very enriching to have some music coming from from that side of the world which we are we are actually planning of of curating some 
some music from artists that we like to have playing during during people playing the sessions and off the top of my head i can't think of any outright advice that we can give that we haven't already put in the adventure if that makes sense because different different characters would have different kind of little quirks around them that that we've created inspired by by stereotypical very prominent tropes in in Slavic folklore and mm-hmm. some of them are given a bit of a twist because for example the strong male figure and the damsel in distress similar to other folklore um other folk stories is very prominent but we didn't want to have that so that's one of the things that we've subverted and we've made more strong female characters and more guys that need saving for example there are a few things that are a bit too old fashioned to to have place in a modern D&D adventure mm-hmm. however we've tried to keep as true to to the source as we can yeah and when it co- now in that in that same regard in that same regard are are there um are there would you say would you say that there are certain classes that might um when it comes to the default um pattern of D&D classes that might be a little bit trickier to implement in this kind of set in this kind of slavic influenced setting mm, if we were 100% representing it the way the way it was told i would say yes however what we're trying to do is because we want to introduce it to to people from other places in mm-hmm. a way that isn't a culture shock yeah we want to introduce it with something that they can relate to that's why we've used classic fantasy as as the thing that unites everything so all the creatures and aspects of slavic mythology that we want to introduce we have grounded within traditional fantasy and we've made it so there is an explanation for every type of character that you want to play you will be able to to have an explanation of why this character is there mhm this isn't i don't think that it's necessarily described within the adventure itself However, it, it is something that we have worked on, and I know we will be putting a lot more effort into. Yeah. Now, some classes, some classes, I could I could see a little more a little more easily than others, like say, um, like say warlocks. Mm. Um, I might I might be a little more discerning of if I was running the Devil's Bridge, I might be a little more discerning about what patrons are used, but it's not something out of the ordinary given. Um, how spirits work. Mm. Um, now, when it, the other thing that I did, I did notice when I was lo- when I was looking through the blog entries that you that you guys had on the Talisum and on the um, Skirtisak, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Is uh, oh good good. No, 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 I was going to, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to say a funny story. Uh, my, my girlfriend is Polish. Mm-hmm. And for a long time, like we had researched this, this creature for a long time. I'm saying probably a year and a half or two years. It's been in our books and we've read different stories about it and stuff like that. And we were like, yes, the Skrzak this, the Skrzak that. And then... My Polish girlfriend comes over and I'm excited to show this creature to her and I say, "Oh yes, this look, this was inspired by Polish folklore and everything." And she says, "Oh yes, the Skrzak." And everyone in the house turns around and says, the the what now? <laughs> <laughs> to, which she, to which she says, "Oh yes, Skrzak, uh, R and Z in uh, Polish language is pronounced Z." You say, okay, so we have studied this creature for so long and yet mispronounced it. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, so I completely understand. There will be a lot of mispronunciation of many creatures mm -hmm. that that we bring, because yep. every single place will have their their typical typical little ways of pronouncing things. Plus, yes. um, e plus, ever plus, um, not everybody is going to have an accent as legible as me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are planning though of having a page. Where, where we show phonetically how names of certain things are pronounced mm -hmm. just for the curious ones and the ones that want to delve a bit deeper into into the different creatures and and items and places etc all right, all right. Um, but one of one of the things that I one of the things that I noticed with the entries for both of them is is the notion of um, sacrifice mm. and um, what I'm curious about is is that a is that a common fixture within um, within Slavic mythology? Uh, put it this way, we have seen it reoccurring throughout mythology, and it goes it is it is very very old. When we spoke to to our cons uh, consultant from uh, the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, mm -hmm. the Dr. Vikhra Baeva, she she was saying that this is this the notion of sacrifice dates way way back much longer than any recorded history so it is it is an archetype and a trope that 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 is just embedded into into us as humans and and it is something that that we're just fascinated by that's why we wanted to incorporate it that's why we wanted to represent it because I mean, if you think about it, even in modern day, people make sacrifices on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It isn't it isn't as as dramatical as I don't know sacrificing a creature to the gods, but you do sacrifice your everyday life to go to work to be able to afford to live. Really, you sacrifice time to spend with people you care about. You sacrifice many things on a daily basis and. And I think that is something that everyone can relate to, and that's why we we thought that it's something important that needs to be needs to be spoken about. Now, now when it comes to when it comes when I read through the um, story part on the uh, Kickstarter, um, I will I will admit that the that the vibe I kept getting was that of a. Um, was that of a was that of a dark, a dark fairy tale? Um, was that was that the approach that you were going with, with um the Devil's Bridge? Definitely, uh, we want to we wanted to and still want to create a vibe that is that is fairy tale because all of this has been taken from fairy tales. Mm -hmm. However, similar to I don't know like. Hans Christian Andersen's tales and the Brothers Grimm, mm -hmm. all fairy tales that are being told to children have a much darker origin that's been, it has been made, like dulled down through the ages. And when you delve deeper into the origin of those fairy tales, you find the sinister and darker origin that they have. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to represent that because... I mean, D and D is is a fan fantastical game. Like it is magical and it is enchanting. However, we've all experienced times where it, things have gotten a bit too dark, and we kind of we wanted to to have this slight creepy element about things, make players feel a bit at unease, like. What, what's going to happen now? Am I the good guy? Is this is this normal? We want to make people ask ask themselves questions. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the th one of the things that's that's mentioned is um, is being based in real locations in Bulgaria. And when it came to when it came to doing research for for the for these locations was was some of that um on location work yes 100% the guys 
basically the the devil's bridge is in the rodopi mountains in bulgaria mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. close to where some of the team is from and we have visited it before and close close by the bridge there is an abandoned village called diadovci which is literally translated to grandpas uh the bridge under the bridge runs the river arda mm -hmm. And there is a town close by called Ardino. However, we decided to name the village close by Ardino because it made more sense to us. The village next to River Arda, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of on-location research of the vibe, the way that it felt. We did research on what the buildings were like how they were created, because there is an actual abandoned village which is currently in ruins next to next to the river. We spoke to locals, we asked them what they know about the bridge, what they've heard, rumors, legends, etc. Mm -hmm. It was it was very, very interesting. And I mean putting work aside from a from a geeky perspective of researching about creating an adventure, it, it was so interesting. Like we were all geeking out about it. Yeah. And I guess that's that's the moment when you know that you're creating something good when you mm -hmm. when you're excited and geeking out about your own project and research. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes now, when it comes to the village that you mentioned, um, the, I'm guessing that in the way the book is going to be formatted, there's going to be a significant amount of time. Um, spent detailing that village and some of the movers and shakers within it. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry. And how uh, they inter and how they interact with each other. Yes. So we have, we have tried to as much as possible to make the village a, a little weak ecosystem. So everything that's happening around what's happening in the forest, what's happening within the village makes sense on a larger scale because here to tease about some future work that we're going to do this village is part of a queendom and this queendom is part of a continent mm -hmm. and there's some things that need to be in place for those bigger places to operate and this the things that happen in this village aren't just a coincidence and aren't random they are things that are a result of bigger powers at place yeah. so we have tried to make everything make as much sense to us knowing what's happening behind the curtains as it would to the players as well is is that part of the reason why you um why you'd set up that the recommended level for this adventure is on the low end of the spectrum at um first through fifth Yes, because the thing is, we want to introduce people to, to the world. We want to allow them to grow their characters in there. It is, it is the beginning of an adventure, not, not in the literal way, but in the, I say, a journey into exploring our world. And we wanted for people to be able to grow their characters in this world and to to start their own stories and we we do have we are planning um, issuing later later adventures and stuff like that however we wanted for people to be able to to grow within this world to to see it as their own to see it as home mm -hmm. now when it comes to when it, com when it comes to the um the the creatures that that um are going that are going to be in this um do you have do you have it do you have it written out as as a um as a bestiary in the in this adventure or do you have it written out that they that they'll appear at certain parts within the adventure as far as i know it is they appear at certain parts throughout the adventure uh, different encounters will have different creatures, and then within the encounter, yes, our, the guy's just confirmed it is it is correct. Mm 
so yeah, the different encounters will have different creatures will, which will be presented at a certain time in the adventure. Uh, maybe or maybe not, we might be planning to create a bestiary-like thing in the future, but only time will tell. All right, I I get yeah, I can um I can definitely go with that. Now, you mentioned before that this game that this game is going that this adventure I should I should correct myself on that is going to be aiming more towards a um more towards a gray area instead of instead of more of a black and white approach. Mm. Um, how do you rectify that with um? With the fact that D and D, especially with the nature of the um, alignment system that is that has had for decades, is a ve- is a very bl- is a, has a very black and white leaning with um, defined good and defined evil. Right. Well, put it this way: many characters, well, players as well, can be a good alignment character. They might think that what they're doing is good. What we're trying to do is make them question it. So if, if for example, you kill a monster in the name of a noble cause, who says that your cause is more noble than the life of that monster? Who says that it is a monster? Who are you to call it a monster? Mm-hmm. It is th- those type of questions that we want to, we want to put in people's heads. We're not dictating this is good or this is bad. We are leaving it to the player to decide, is what I'm doing good or is it bad? And it's a matter of perspective as well, because for some person, doing something might be the good thing to do, but for another, it might be the exact opposite. Yeah. And I think... I. What's interesting about that sort, about that sort, of, mor- about that sort of moral grayness is... Where is where that fits in with the um, dualism that you've discussed on your blog and as well as on the Kickstarter page with the um, with everything in between um, the extremes of Svarog and Chernobog? Mm. It is put it this way: it shows that even the good guys can be tempted, and even the bad guys can be transformed into the path of good. Mm-hmm. It is. It is, we've tried to make the tale about both corruption and redemption. We've tried to, basically, to give that message that, basically, you've got a second chance. (laughs) And it it seems that in the, in the, um, based on on things like the um, Leshy, it seems that in in the, in between of of those two extremes uh, is... More um cha- is more chaotic notions. Oh yeah, <laughs> the things that many many of the creatures of nature and the creatures of the forest, similar to other mythologies, are very chaotic and naughty, mischievous kind of creatures. And we wanted to put a bit of fun in this whole thing because a lot of a lot of the adventure is going to be a bit tense. It's going to be with a lot of suspense in it. Mm-hmm. However, we wanted to put a bit of fun and play in the whole thing that's that's why we introduced the forest the fake creatures of, of slavic mythology and as well those creatures similarly to what i mentioned before they've been represented in 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 many ways in some ways as villains in some ways good in some ways just pure chaos so we've done our best to take those sources and try and represent them in ways in which in which we can bring more color to the adventure. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the NPCs, when it comes to the people of um, Ardino, um, I'm guess I'm guessing that a lot a lot of their um, a lot of their individual write ups will be on their um, background and how they re- how they relate to other NPCs and how they see um, outsiders, which for all intents and purposes, the I I get the feeling that most that most of the adventure is written as if the as if the um, player characters are 
outsiders coming upon coming upon this area. Mm. So so I mean, the we have we have given we have given a lot of uh, different potential backgrounds and mm. hooks that would be specific to different kinds of players. Uh, put it this way: every every kind of player will be able to find a way that makes sense that can incorporate why they're there and what they're doing there. Yeah. And they will have an excuse. We, we've tried to, even though there is the option of you are a group of adventurers and you've come across this town and you've just decided to go into the inn, which a lot of people starting out kind of opt in for, we have given them the option of, you know, when you've got a DM that likes to sit down and have a session zero with people and be like, okay, how can we intertwine your character so it makes sense both for you and for the setting? Mm -hmm. So you can feel like you're a part of this setting and not just a random character that's been slotted in there. So we have made sure to, to give those options for people that want to do a bit of pre-work, to do some... To, to make them to give themselves a backstory that would make sense and wouldn't just be random, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, when I look when I look at what's going to be in the um, book, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the forest, I'm curious if that's going if that's going to be if that's going to lean more and more in the um, crawl ki kind of approach or if it's or if the approach and how the enchanted forest is be is um, being set up and the adventure is run a bit more um, narrative standard. It is it is more narrative led because mm -hmm. the the I mean the pl the players will have a reason for being there. They will have a goal, and they can explore and spend quite a bit of time there. But but the reason why they're there is is something they have a reason for being there, mm -hmm. um, and, and they have, as I said, certain goals and certain things that they want to achieve there. So it will be more narrative led. However, we have we've made it so, put it this way: when we sit down to play, we love we love role playing and spending a lot of time role playing rather than trying to speed through an adventure we like if we have a bard in the party the bard likes to i don't know put on the show in the inn even though we know that we need to get out of this inn because we don't want to spend three sessions in there <laughs> but, but we still we still kind of take our time even dull tasks as doing research we take our time with it so we've given we've given the opportunity for people that like taking their time to be there but if you're the kind of player that just wants to go and do the job you can still do that mm -hmm. and we've kind of made it so there are consequences to both things if you want to take your time with things and invest in research you will be rewarded if you just go through something and kill things without thinking of what you're doing, there might be consequences. So it is it is leaning towards kind of teaching players that don't know this or rewarding players that do know this that everything has a consequence and and that consequence could be positive or negative. Yep. Now one of the things that you had mentioned um, early, early on, that I am a bit, cu I'm a bit curious about is you've been, you've been working with um, Doctor Vi Vira Beva. Um, Vira. Vira. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yes. Sorry. Uh, go on. Um. How how did how did that particular meeting come about? Did you did um did you did did you did you were you the one who approached, or was it the other way around? Uh, no, we we approached her because mm -hmm. we wanted to 
put it this way, it's, it's, all, it's all good, it's all well and good to do your own research. However, we are not academics in this field. And there is so many sources, both written in books and online, that there is there is no way to to go down to how authentic some of them are. Mm-hmm. And even though we are breaking this through the prism of fantasy and through the prism of D and D, we wanted to have a solid a solid base, a solid foundation that we can build up on. So we approached her, we explained the project to her, and this was this was the first time she had heard of, of D&D, which which was very interesting trying to explain to her what we're going what we're planning on doing with with uh, Slavic mythology. And it is I cannot explain how how charged we are after every conversation we have with her because we walk we walk into a meeting with with questions with curiosity and then after answering everything that that we've had in mind and giving and giving us some extra information that we didn't even think of of asking for we're just left with more questions and ideas and everything makes sense in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Um, also, also, it's important to have someone that can turn around and say, yes, what you've written makes sense, what you've written shows that you've done your research, and it is very close to, if not the same, as how these things were portrayed in reality. And also, it, it gives us a different point of view, you know, because when you're stuck so long into creating something, you kind of need someone to to have a look at it from the side and be like, hmm, but have you thought about this? Oh, oh yeah, we haven't. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, that re- in that regard, when you were iterating upon this idea, were there, were, there any, were there any particular things that in the process of doing this research that you had to for lack of a better term, unlearn? Hmm. It is, it's It's not, I wouldn't say unlearn. I would say add on. Because all the stories we knew were to an extent correct. And all the research we've done ourselves is correct. But the thing is that there is so many different perspectives and so many different peoples in different areas that tell the story a slightly different way because a lot of folklore if not the majority of folklore uh is word of mouth and you know when you tell a story when you retell a story every time some people might have added a bit to it uh there is influences from your environment there's influences from what's culturally happening at the time and we just learned a lot more that enriched what we already knew rather than had to unlearn what we already knew. Mm-hmm. Now, when, now when, it com- when, it comes to, when it comes to that, um, has, the, has, there been, has there been any thought down the line of, um, of, in, of integrating some, some player-focused um, add-ons when it comes to the when it comes to the devil's bridge whether it, whether the, it be subclasses or so, or something to that extent uh to the devil's bridge no uh player wise the only thing that we have developed are the backgrounds mm-hmm. uh however we are working on and we have been for a while on some player options such as classes some subclasses uh some spells some different different bits and pieces uh maybe even races and we are planning on on releasing those down the line however they 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 are very much in in very initial stages at the moment mm-hmm. however we do have them in the works and we are 100% excited about about introducing them yeah 
No. We are we are gonna have sorry in the in the Devil's Bridge we are gonna have magic items though for mm -hmm. players. Now, one of the stretch goals that I um that I saw that I saw which um it which congrats on unlocking this most recent one um is the custom character sheet. Now, mm. with with that, it, would it be f when it comes to that sheet? Is it is it mainly t taking the default um D and D fifth edition character sheet and putting a bit of a Slavic spin on it? It will be it will be more tailored to to the adventure itself. Mm -hmm. So it will be something that that will help you, hopefully, uh, immerse yourself this tad further into into the adventure. Uh, we will have it will be there will be Slavic inspiration in it. There will be um, there will be uh, obviously everything will be purely design wise. The original character sheet is going to be the standard character sheet. Mm -hmm. However, the design of it will be around the adventure itself and around the the vibe that we're trying to give. All right. All right. Now, when men when mentioning some of the um, encounters, we had meant we had mentioned the Talisman, we had we had mentioned the Skrak. Um, but what what could you tell me about the um, Samodiva? Since that's the third one that's showcased on the Kickstarter page. Right. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna think for a second here because I wouldn't want to give away spoilers. Mm. What I can tell you is a bit of background of the Samodiva as a creature in mythology. Yeah, that, that's what I was aim that's what I was aiming for with the uh, question. Okay, well, the the Samudiva has been similar to everything else that we've discussed. She's been presented with diff in different ways throughout Bulgarian, Macedonian, and Serbian. Basically, this kind this side of the of the world mythologies and folklore. She is kind of a playful mischievous forest spirit however you shouldn't underestimate her just because she looks uh playful and mischievous because she can also wield powers beyond the cap capabilities of many heroes so it is it is a a prominent figure in bulgarian folklore and it is something that we have grown up with. The Samudivi are, are very integrated in the stories that we even studied in school in literature lessons. So we very much wanted to portray this creature because because it is it is so iconic and relatable to us. Mm -hmm. Now, how many how many um how many pages would you say the com the um, complete book is going to go at? To be completely honest, I, I cannot give you a straight answer for this because we are we are still in the stages of finishing up the the adventure itself, and then all of the content is being given to a page designer, and all of the text will be transformed into a easy to digest way because what we didn't know in the beginning when we started is there is so much work put into purely structuring the text on the page so it flows well. And that's why we've got the, uh, a wonderful person called Sneja in, in our team who we're going to basically give all of the text to and all of the images to. And then she's going to have the colossal task of making it nice. <laughs> so... Even though we have an idea of how many pages text we have and how many images we have, it will be very unrealistic if we gave an estimate. This is why we've leaned more to give an idea of, of the progression that the players are going to have through the adventure because this is a way more realistic thing to set your expectations on. And when it... 
when it comes to when it comes to that, the now give, given some of my own running gags and my reviews, I have to ask this: Do you plan on putting it in an index? <laughs> Mm, potentially, <laughs> potentially <laughs> not. Uh, I guess you'll find out when when you read the final product. <laughs> yeah, it's well, the, depending on depending on the si- depending on the size of the final product. Some sometimes I'm I'm a bit more of a stickler on that than others. Um, and I've I've roast I've roasted some I've roasted some people for having large books with no indexes. So. It's oh. kind of a running gag for me. I mean, if you it, put it this way, we we are thinking of making it as easy to navigate as possible. Mm-hmm. Where even the, the the digital the digital edition is going to have also hyperlinks in it to be able to navigate. If something says, "Oh yeah, refer to X Y on page Z," you're going to have a link to page Z in mm-hmm. in that hyperlink. So it is going to be easy to navigate. We are. We are planning on having an index, yes, outlining the whole adventure and what's on what page and everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're planning on, even as I said, we're going to have, we're going into such detail that we want to have uh, a page outlining the pronunciation of different creatures. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. What, what we want to do is, because this is our first product, we want to put our whole into it. We want to put blood sweat and tears into it and and make it as good as possible because it is the first time that people are going to to see what what we're putting out and it is very important because we're all firm believers into in in the philosophy that f- you don't have a second chance to make a first impression so i can de- i can definitely go with that um when it comes to the when it comes to the adventure, one one thing I'm curious about is if you're if if you're planning on um, re- presenting it in acts, like but like is this going is it going to be presented as like a is like a three acts um, tale? Uh, as as for the number of acts, I'm not sure. However, we we are we are presenting it in acts. That's I'm I'm certain in that, and. And it is going to be, it is everything, it, because it is, it is a story at the end of the day, everything is going to be presented with acts, and then within those acts you're going to have the different encounters, and it's going to be a progression through that. However, it is not going to be linear in, in any way, shape, or form, because certain things can come before others. Players might decide to turn left rather than right, some players might decide to stay in the middle and see what happens. You know, I mean, we've we've all seen the countless uh, memes and running gags about DMs doing extensive research and preparation into this massive battle, and then the players decided that they want to drink beer in the pub. So we have we have made it seem as as choice-based and free roam as possible while still having a running arc. Which I, I can definitely... Um, and in, in, that, in that regard, I'm, ge- I'm guessing that in between, that there's going to be more... Do you, ha- do you have it where there are um, major, major beats in, bet- in between lulls or is, it go- or is it going from beat to beat? And obviously I'm not asking for spoilers in this regard, more of... Mm understanding the flow the flow of it is that there is there is a few major things that need to happen as in any adventure however there is many optional ones and as i said we want to give give people that go for the optional stuff some sort of reward for that being like well done you've you've actually made an effort to to find out why this thing works the way it does so now you have a piece of knowledge that other adventurers might not. Mm-hmm. And everything kind of adds to a few different combinations. However, as I said, we've, we've given the option for, for players that want, to, that want to just power through it and for people that want to explore and delve into it in more detail. Yeah. But the way you describe it, I'm guessing that there are going... 
there are going to be, for lack of a better term, side quests um, throughout throughout the book that are uh, that are optional but can still be taken. It is I I wouldn't I wouldn't call it necessarily a side quest. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is more like different branches of the same tree. It is it is more as adi uh, additional reading. Like when you read an article and you're like, oh yeah, there's this, and you can read more about it here. Mm -hmm. It is it is that that kind of that kind of experience. And the idea is that the more preparation you do, the more prepared you're going to be at the end. Well, fortune favors the prepared. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and. To to that to that particular um, end, I'm get I'm guessing that there is that there is going to be a um, there's going to be a chapter in the book dedicated primarily to advice for the GM when it comes to running the campaign. Oh yes, there is there is going to be a lot of tips and tricks for the GMs because. We've we've all been in the GM seat, and we all know how helpful the extra paragraph and the extra the extra heads up from from the developers and note mm -hmm. basically how helpful this is. Also, we are currently setting up a Discord channel where we're going to be uh, active on, and we want to. This is, by the way, we've. This is the first time we've mentioned it. We haven't even mentioned on social media. So, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of insight. Um, we we are planning on being very communicative with people and and answering people and helping them out where they can't, where they don't know what to do, and when they don't know. Okay, I'm uh, one of my players is a tiefling. How do I? put them into this adventure so we are trying to add as much help and tips as we can in the adventure itself however as we all know every now and again some things might be missed out and we are prepared to answer those and we are prepared to to be there for all of the gms listening and the ones that are not um yeah, that's that's what we're what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And also, as one of the as one of the pledges on our Kickstarter, we also have one to one conversations with GMs because we know that that some people might have a lot of questions that they can't put into one message to send this on social media, and some of those things might require just just some extra chatting. Yep. But but we are definitely trying to put as much as we can in the book and to to that end i'm gu i'm guessing that within that advice there's going there's going to be bits on um on how on how to maintain the more suspenseful aspects because given given that i'd the way it's the way the devil's bridge is described there's there seems to be the implication of a heavy emphasis on atmosphere and mm. That's one of those things that, in my experience, is always um, tricky depending on what table you're dealing with. Because, of course, in order to, when maintaining atmosphere with multiple people, every um, more people have to be um, on board. One hundred percent. I mean, we are we are very much aware that that there is a lot of different kind of players and a lot of different kinds of atmospheres on the on the gaming table. And it is difficult as a as a GM to to kind of be like, okay, guys, it, it's time you stop joking about there's serious things happening. So we've kind of tried to give tips and tricks on how to s do that in subtle ways that aren't noticed by the players. We've given tricks about atmosphere, different things happening around, different bits of foreshadowing even that that players themselves will be like oh uh guys did you did you notice this <laughs> there's transitions from from place to place from act to act with advice of um 
how do you push the party to to go further, giving people the sense of urgency, giving people the sense of of an imminent threat being there? It's because because there is there is always the case of of people not knowing what they're supposed to do next, therefore wasting time at the current encounter. We've tried to give the the GM the tools to avoid that and the tools to to let the party know what the next step is and how they should progress on. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to, now, you guys have... Um, you guys are current at the time of this recording. You guys are at sixteen point seven. Um, oh, I I spoke too soon. It just up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let me convert it proper. You guys are at um thirteen thousand pounds and um change. Which congratulations yeah. on on smashing it that that thoroughly. Thank um, you very much. Now, once once the um once the gold date once the gold date of October first hits and all the um. All the extra paperwork is um, handled. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? See, uh, we've we've already we've already given the estimated delivery times on Kickstarter itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, one of the which which are uh, December, we're thinking currently mid to late December for the digital and January for the physical. However, originally when we launched this Kickstarter, we had in mind a quite different adventure than what is currently being created because of all the stretch goals uh, reached, because of all the funds that we will be receiving. And here's to say that everything, like all the extra funds that we have are going to be reinvested in making the product what we've promised that we'll make it. We are aiming to, to basically, as I said, do our 100% best creating this. And with all the extra artwork, there might be some extra time that's needed to develop that, or the extra encounters, or creating the book with hardcover instead of softcover because it's a completely different process Mm -hmm. printing-wise. We have taken that into account. However, there might be be some extra things that pop out because we are currently also, we did not at all expect that so many people would be interested in the product. I mean, we were were quite happy with, with what we were doing and proud of what we were doing however this this amount of support we did not expect it and we still cannot realize what's happening uh so we are going to be creating a lot more books than we expected which is also going to be is going to take more time basically yeah I but gotcha. we are, we're going to do our best to to deliver everything within within the the time frame and if something arises we are firm believers in the in being transparent because people people know that we are people people know that certain things take time and if you we think that if you if we say everything the way it is people will understand rather than trying to i don't know disguise it in in some way yeah i got i got you now with that, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell that is time zones to come all the to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> thank um, you very much as well. This is, of, I mean, of course we we've we've heard the other interviews that you've done, and all of us got really excited when you approached us. And one hundred percent, we we're very, as I said humbled and honored to be guests in the temple mm-hmm. and of and of course anytime you guys see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not <laughs> mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> thank you very much and definitely i think that we will be back in the temple 
because it is it is 100 percent a location that needs to be visited at least once in an adventurer's lifetime <laughs> yes um and of course a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there'll be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>